So in the last lecture, we discussed uh, an electron and the discovery of an electron. And so today, I'm going to talk about uh, a photon. So um, essentially, in the last quarter of the 1800s, physicists were trying to reconcile all these different areas of physics that we knew a lot about. So we knew a lot about mechanics and electricity and uh, magnetism and thermodynamics and optics. And they were trying to bring them all together and create one sort of uh, big picture. Okay, and it, they did it in a very simple way. They were essentially trying to look at how hot objects cooled off because that really does um, combine a lot of those different ideas. Okay, so they um, wanted to look at the relationship of uh, and a hot object cooling by just radiation. So energy can transfer and heat can transfer in three different ways. It can transfer by conduction, convection, and radiation. So you have a solid particle or a solid object and solid objects are made up of particles that are vibrating in position. And the energy, the kinetic energy of those particles is directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature cycle, which we learned about in thermodynamics and we knew. Okay, So as those objects uh, vibrate at the surface or the interface between the air and the, the, the object, there is a transfer of energy from the object to the air, and that's what we know as um, heat, is that transfer of energy. So when it's between the air and the, the metallic surface, that is, um, that is convection or conduction. But radiation also occurs. So you, you've seen this before. If you heat up a metal really hot, it begins to glow. It's giving off light. That is radiation. So they wanted to somehow be able to measure just the radiation, eliminating conduction and convection. And so they created something called a black body, which is essentially just a piece of metal that you've completely hollowed out that has a very small opening drilled into it. And and you heat that object up and inside you create sort of a vacuum chamber so there is not convection or conduction going on and you measure the amount of radiation that is coming off that metal okay so the radiation that is coming off of that metal um, is the energy or the temperature being released from that metal okay um, so this, these were called black body uh, experiments, okay? Um, and the radiation that was measured was called black body radiation. So essentially what they did was they uh, heated objects to different temperatures and they measured the intensity of light at different wavelengths that came off of that hot object as it cooled. Okay, so if we look at this figure, this shows three different uh, graphs at three different temperatures, and we're talking about really hot temperatures here, 4,000 Kelvin, 3,000 Kelvin, 2,000 Kelvin. These are um, really hot temperatures. And as you can see, there's a peak intensity at different wavelengths for the different temperatures. So as the... Um, as the heat is gets higher, so as the temperature gets higher, 4,000 Kelvin, the peak intensity is actually at a smaller wavelength. Okay, and then we have a cooler temperature, and um, we have the peak intensity being at a larger wavelength, and then even larger uh, for this temperature. Okay, now um, remember that really short wavelengths have high energy. So we would expect that a really hot object would peak, have a really high intensity at a low wavelength because that's a really high energy wave um, and therefore um, the intensity would be greater because the temperature was greater. Okay, um, so this sort of region of the graph makes a lot of sense, okay? That you have a hot object, so there are high intensities at low wavelength or high energy waves, okay? And less intensity at hot waves. But the graph drops off for every single um, one of the different temperatures. And this was a phenomenon that was not understood by anyone. And so it was essentially ignored because there was no theory. Nobody had an idea why this was happening. So really the graphs weren't completely useless. They were used um, 
uh, by a scientist named Wine. He actually used the data, but he only would use the peak data. He didn't use any sort of any other side of the graph. So he would use the peak, and he equated um, the wavelength of light um, to the the temperature of an object. So really, what sort of practical application does this have? This is how we uh, like would determine the temperature, how astronomers determine the temperature of different stars. So like red giants or like white dwarf stars, um, they all have different temperatures, and we were able to determine those temperatures by using um, this uh, this this curve. Okay. Now I'm not. We're not even going to discuss that equation. I'm not even going to give it to you because we now know the um, fully understand the black body radiation, and therefore we don't really use that that equation anymore. Okay, so. This man, Max Planck, um, he was a mathematician and physicist, and uh, he decided that he was going to take uh, the data from the black body experiment and create a mathematical model, and then hopefully that would the math would tell him what his theory should be. You know, and this is kind of backwards because usually people have a theory first and then they test to prove it. Um, so, you know, he did it backwards. He used the data to create a math mathematical model to create his theory. And really what happened, what he discovered was, you know, so outside his realm of possibility or he thought was so impossible, he didn't even believe it himself. So when he presented his data and presented his research, he stated that he did not believe his conclusion, but he wanted to present his, his, his information so that someone could disprove him because he knew that he was wrong. Okay, and so his conclusion was that um, light jumped off surfaces in little bits and pieces like particles instead of a continuous stream uh, of energy like a wave. So up until this point, we have performed all of these experiments, you know, Young, Young's double slit experiment, all these experiments to prove that light was a wave. And here we had an experiment that was showing that light was more of like finite particles of energy, okay, um, which seemed completely counterintuitive and nobody really understood how they could you know, reconcile those two things. So um, he called these little bits of energy quanta, and that's um, how quantum physics got its name. It was from him using this term quanta. Now we uh, call these little particles of light photons because of, of Albert Einstein. Okay, so what was his mathematical model? His mathematical model was that E, which is the energy of a photon, is equivalent to H, which is Planck's constant that he derived from the data, times fre the frequency of light. Okay, so the frequency of the light radiation or the light coming off was equivalent to, or times Planck's constant is equivalent to the energy of a photon. And Planck's constant, and this is also given to you in your reference tables, we have two different uh, constants based on what energy unit we're going to use. Okay, so remember that frequency is uh, one over seconds, okay? It's a hertz, but it's actually one over seconds. So the unit for Planck's constant is energy times seconds in order to cancel out those seconds and give us the unit for energy that we know, which is either joules or electron volts. Now you might not remember about electron volts because I really only mentioned it once when we were studying electricity and magnetism and never talked about it again, but um, wanted to introduce that to you so you know, as we come to this point where I know you'll see electron volts um, more frequently. An electron volt is essentially a unit um, of energy that um, is a lot smaller than a joule. A joule is a really large bit of energy and so the numbers are ridiculously small. It might not seem like there's that much of a difference here. But an electron volt is just a different unit of energy that we use that is more applicable to really, really tiny particle and electrical energy rather than, you know, joules we use for like large scale objects. So Planck's constant is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds or 4 0.14 times 10 to the negative 15th electron volts times seconds. And so right here, it might be a little bit difficult to see, but I'll read it for you.
um, this is an, a sample type problem. So it says the energy of a yellow photon. Yellow light with a frequency of approximately 6 times 10 to the 14th hertz is the predominant frequency in sunlight. What is the energy carried by a photon um, or a quantum of light having this frequency? Okay, so essentially it gives us the frequency of light, which is yellow, so 6 times 10 to the 14th hertz. We multiply it by Planck's constant, and we see that every photon is equal to 4 times 10 to the negative 19th joules of, of energy. And if we convert that to electron volts, you can see that it's 2.5 electron volts. That kind of shows, you know, that electron volts are sometimes a more reasonable value to work with when we're talking about really, really tiny amounts of energy. Okay, so this was his mathematical model that he came up with but did not believe because he did not believe that light could be a particle because of all this experimentation we had done to prove that light was a wave. Okay, uh, so in comes Albert Einstein, and Albert Einstein around um, 1905, uh, he had heard about um, Planck's work and uh, he discovered some things or determined some things about a photon. We're, we're going to go into a little bit more detail in the next lecture about something called the photoelectric effect, where um, which is an experiment that Einstein um, explained that proved Planck's theory. Um, but for now, I'm just going to talk, give you a little bit more um, information about a photon uh, and these equations and these relationships were determined by Einstein. Okay. So photons move at C, or the speed of light, in a vacuum. Um, and they have no mass, but they carry momentum. So these are things that Albert Einstein realized, that photons move at the speed of light, that they are massless, um, but they have momentum. Okay? And if you recall, momentum is equal to mass times velocity. So if your mass is zero, okay, how can we calculate your momentum? There has to be another way to calculate momentum. Okay? And he determined here in this equation that the momentum of a photon, remember momentum is P, is equivalent to Planck's constant divided by the wavelength of that photon or the wavelength of the light. Okay, and so from this, you can, using our wave equation that velocity equals wavelength times frequency, or C equals wavelength times frequency, we can then derive the, these equations. So you have the energy of a photon being equal to Planck's constant times C over the wavelength, which is just using the wavelength, or the, the wave equation, okay, and solving for frequency, so C over the wavelength. Okay. And since we see that h over the wavelength here is momentum, we can also say, well, E equals P, um, the momentum, times the, the speed of light. Okay, and um, so, you know, having these three equations, um, or these three equations can be derived, and that allows us to be able to solve for um, frequency, wavelength, momentum, or energy of a photon given that we have one of those values. So we can solve for any of those three or four values given that we have um, the other three in the set. Okay. Now one thing I want to stress here is that this equation and these relationships can only be used for photons, for massless particles. Um, in in next lessons, in the next few lessons, we're going to talk about electrons um, moving and flying off objects. So I don't want you to get confused and always be thinking about the distinction between what equations you use for an electron that we know has mass, okay, and therefore can also have momentum, but and carry energy, and a photon which is massless, okay. So never use these equations um, on an electron; they can only be used on a photon. So in the next lectures, we'll talk about uh, the photoelectric effect and a few other experiments that were conducted to show that um, uh, photons have momentum. <laughs>